Well, hi, everybody. Uh, I was just this morning in Frankfurt giving a talk in the same session as this guy, who's one of the chairmen of the European Central Bank. And uh, you might not be able to see the text that I've written down the bottom there, but I just wrote uh, ECB board member Yves Mensch on Mersch speaking at the Faris Euro, Euro Finance Week in Frankfurt. I'm up next. We won't agree on much. Uh, you would have found that out if he'd still hung around, but like exactly the same thing happened in the previous year with Peter Pratt, who was another a member of the board member, he disappeared after giving his talk, so he had to get urgently back to the European Central Bank, which pissed me off. I wanted to take him on. Uh, he then, um, uh, as I left, I had to rush to get the taxi back to the airport, back to here, to give this lecture today. The person who took me out of the room said that he was standing outside chatting to people. So his urgent need wasn't to get back to the European Central Bank, it was to avoid hearing what I was going to say. So I'm going to give you the uh, similar, the rather more detailed talk than I gave there. But people like him, in my opinion, are giving rise, and I'll bring up the presentation I gave there today once I find it on the computer. Hang a second. Okay. I wasn't trying to hold anything back, but that was the title of my talk, The European Central Bank Doesn't Understand the Economy. And he, pretty much, he pretty much proved that while I was listening to him talking. Uh, but what I what I wanted to say, I'll just actually bring it up uh, using the slideshow thing here. Uh, uh, the total total political earthquake in the last few years around the world, and now, of course, America got hit last week. But people like Varoufakis getting elected and Corbyn becoming leader of the Liberal of the Labor Party, despite the uh, his own party members trying to stop him. Uh, and then, of course, Trump winning last week. And the other ones we might see, are the, the, I actually don't know the name of the guy on the right all that well. I know the other two. Beppo is the, the guy with the funny looking face. He actually is a professional comedian. And uh, about two or three years ago, he started what's called the Five Star Movement in Italy. And his promise was uh, to shake up politics in Italy. But he also is now, with the, his party is now, looks like it's going to win the next election whenever that's held. There's actually a referendum about a, what looks like a sort of trivial procedure, procedural thing in the um, in the Italian uh, electoral uh, or, um, um, parliamentary system, uh, and it looks like you look at the change from the outside, it looks quite sensible to, to a change of the nature of the Senate there. Um, but in fact, the majority is going to vote against it, not because they don't like the change; they just want to snub their noses at the people in power. So if the current leader loses that in November, in, 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 I think it's a matter of weeks away or less, if they lose that vote, then it's quite possibly going to be a parliamentary election in, in Italy where he would win. Woman in the middle, you know who she is? Le Pen. Pardon? Marie Le Pen. that's right. She's the leader of the, of the Front National, which was described as a Nazi organisation, and certainly under its father it had that, uh, that ilk. Um, she's tried to get to, to expunge some of the racist elements. It's sure to still have that same foundation. But she's actually she, she's quite a remarkable political leader. She threw her own party, her own father, out of the party that he formed. Okay? So she's not your usual um, uh, redneck in that sense. And she's in every possibility of winning the next French election, which is next year. In fact, I, I must predict she'll win the next election because the polls have said she won't win it. Okay? Right. After the last set of polls, anybody who takes polls seriously has got a problem. Um, and the guy on the right, on the uh, the far right, appropriately, is a fairly, uh, from what I understand, a fairly racist member of the Dutch Parliament, who's also leading one of the major parties there. So this whole revolt going on, and I basically said the reason it's happening is because the policies of the central banks, uh, largely because they don't understand how the economy operates. So I might come back to that one in a bit uh, because I've got a lot more detail on the presentation I've got for you guys. But I wanted to make those points to this bloke. And he simply disappeared. And last year I thought it was just because they're in a hurry. Second, maybe it's in a hurry, but then I find he's waiting outside having coffee and chatting with people outside the talk where I'm lambasting him on the inside. So there's a, there's a real gutlessness, in my opinion, about the leadership of the European Union. It's no wonder they're losing control of Europe. And I think it's quite possible. Uh, if Marine Le Pen wins or Beppo wins next year, then they're part, they're both parties' policies include leaving the euro. And Marine Le Pen said as soon as she, she's in power, they leave the euro the next day. Not a case of triggering Article 50 and taking two years to negotiate. She's going to abolish it. So things are going to get interesting next year. But uh, it was obvious 20-something years ago 
that they were going to get interesting at some point because I'm just going to quote a guy. Have you ever heard the name Wynne Godley before? Okay. He's someone you should learn about because he's one of the neglected giants of economics who's well known in the non-orthodox areas that I'm part of but has been neglected by the mainstream. But writing, he just wrote, a, a, just wrote this article in 1992, which was the year the Maastricht Treaty was, was signed. And uh, he said that looking at it, he read, it was an article in the, in the London Review of Books, which you can still get access to. It's not an academic journal. It's about a one- or two-page paper. I highly recommend reading it. But he, this was his punchline. He said, if a country or region has no power to devalue, which, of course, is what happens when you join the euro, and is not the beneficiary of a system of fiscal equalisation, complicated way of saying you don't have budgets that... Um, means that some regions get... You don't have a, a European-level treasury. So, therefore, if an area is depressed in Europe, it's got to cover its own costs, whereas with a country like America, if part of America is depressed, the wages or the, the, the welfare payments from Washington provide a cash flow for that part. So you don't have the same regional disparities in America you get in the European system. So there is nothing to stop it suffering a process of cumulative and terminal decline leading in the end, and this is a real punchline, to emigration is the only alternative to poverty or starvation. Now, a huge part of the pressure for Brexit was over emigration to England from Europe, not just the European Union, but also you know, part Poland and other parts, but nonetheless all about this expanding Europe and having free movement of labour and free movement of capital. And his prediction was, given the structure of the euro, this would lead to mass emigration, not because you, were, you, know, you preferred the weather in London to the, prefer to the weather in Spain, but because you were simply emigrating away from a failed economic system. So I think it's very, very prescient. Now, he was, he's at the, the progressive end of economic, uh, economics in general. He's not a, he's a, most, most mainstream economists wouldn't know his name, and he's regarded as being rather left wing. Milton Friedman, on the other hand, you all know that name, I take it. You know, the, the father of you know, a very right wing approach to economics made much the same comment. He said that it's unfavourable for a common currency. You have separate nations speaking different language of the different customs who've got far more loyalty to their own country than they have to Europe, uh, whereas Americans have loyalty to America, first and foremost, and secondary to their states. Uh, and even though it's supposed to be a free trade area, uh, he said it's still there's, there's less free movement in, in Europe than there is in America. So he was two extremes of, econo of, of political spectrum and economics, both expected the euro to fail. They weren't fans of it at all. Uh, now, if you look at the state of Europe right now, the unemployment rate there is about twice the rate that it is in England. You can see the big and in, huge increase in unemployment in 2008, which is a global phenomenon. There's very, very few countries that didn't have an increase in unemployment and only two countries in the OECD that didn't record a recession that year, South Korea and Australia. Everybody else had a recession. And you can see the increase in unemployment. But then from 2012 on, Unemployment in England has been falling, whereas in Europe it continued rising. Now, the data goes past that point. It's only up to 2014. I'll, I'll get a later chart and replace that before I put it up on the, on the uh, study space. But that's the divergence in performance, which is a huge difference. And the Europeans simply aren't willing to admit that you know, they got this badly wrong. Now, that's um, that particular chart, by the way. I might even have it linked here. Let's see if that's possible. We'll find out. That's uh, a fabulous resource. Um, that you can find called the St. Louis Fred. Has anybody discovered that yet? You heard about it? Okay. It's, I'll just show you quickly how it works. So this is it's the website. It's called Fred for Federal Reserve Economic Data. Okay. And the St. Louis branch of the Fed runs it. So if I wanted, for example, to say, let's say, unemployment rate euro area, Then unemployment total all persons a euro region. Let's go for the monthly data. Harmonised unemployment rate. Bang, there's your chart. Not bad, eh? And you can also download it as either an Excel file or a PowerPoint or, or a, a, uh, uh, an image file. And you can edit. So I'll just quickly do that. Let's actually add in, um, add another line. And I'll have UK unemployment rate. So we have, uh, uh, let's see, we've got a whole range of different ones here. So it's sometimes hard to work out which one to use. But this is monthly, 
so February 2015, it's not quite far enough. Let's go down and see with the other ones that go further. This is partly the offers of uh, ONS, which has got dreadful. Um, here we go, harmonise, there we go. That's only December 2014, I'll have to live with that. Okay, add data series. Boom, okay, there you go. So I highly recommend if you want to put, you know, when you're doing essays and stuff like that, and you want to find data, this is the place to go to. You can download the data as well, so on and so forth. So probably one of the easiest to use and uh, most impressive websites I've ever seen. You can also do things like, this, oh, this isn't necessary for this one, but it's worth showing how to do it. You choose format. And well, let's say I want to have uh, the second one on, the, on a different axis. I can whack them on comparable axes and compare them that way. So highly worthwhile. That's where that particular chart came from anyway. Now, if you look at the state, if you break it down and look at, at the country level, then it's worse than what I showed you at the aggregate level because, of course, Germany has very low unemployment, but other parts of Europe have got astronomically high levels of unemployment. So I've got the USA in there for comparison. That's the black line. And Germany, as you can see, has just trended down. Uh, all the way from straight through the euro, through the crisis, is now down to 5% unemployment, great for Germany. Uh, France, on the other hand, has had increasing unemployment since the crisis hit, running at about, of the order of about 10% right now, which of course is fueling uh, the support you get from Marine Le Pen. Look at Spain and Greece. Okay. So unemployment levels of 25% plus, that's the level we saw back in the Great Depression. So the only way to describe that is there's a Great Depression happening in Europe. Not as severe in terms of its impact. Well, pretty severe in Greece on people's actual living standards because they've been cutting welfare and all sorts of other crazy things like that. So something in the euro caused that. If it's, the euro is that much worse than the rest of the world, um, then you've got to blame the structures they have which make them different to the rest of the world, which is having a, sh a shared currency. Um, and it's also split up in how it affects the different parts as well. Spain and Greece are in serious trouble. Germany is doing quite nicely, thanks very much. Okay. Big difference there. Now, when you look at the, the Maastricht Treaty, the whole objective was something that I find strange to look at being coming from Australia, having not had that experience of Europe tearing itself apart and you know, national, two, two, two global wars fought here. Um, but there's an incredible desire to stop Europe fighting with itself. And a huge political push was behind this for integration to end the division of the European continent. That was the objective. And deepen solidarity while respecting their history, yada, yada, yada. Uh, strengthening and convergence of their economies. Can you imagine a bigger fail in terms of what the objectives are versus what the outcome has been? Convergence. Germany has unemployment rate below 5%. Greece has unemployment rate, rate above 25%. It's anything but succeeded what it's after. And they thought there'd be a single and stable currency. So these are all the grand ambitions behind it. And it replaced about 20 national currencies when it began. And that what that meant was those currencies couldn't devalue against each other anymore. Now, if you look at what's happened with Italy, uh, you, compare, you want to compare countries which are comparable in some ways in terms of technological level. I would rather compare Italy to Germany than, say, Greece to Germany because Greece does not make cars, okay? does not have a large manufacturing base. Uh, Italy does make cars, has a large manufacturing base. But what would happen regularly is Italian prices would rise faster than German prices. So they could devalue and that would reset the prices, whether that was in a, in a fixed exchange rate system or under floating exchange rates. Movements in the lira against the, uh, against the mark enabled Italy to continue being successful, even though it, it, it was, its prices were rising faster than German prices were. Now, that was taken away by forming the euro. Um, now, the whole idea was to promote growth and stability, and this, this whole idea was to, to achieve harmonious and balanced development. So you're trying to get 20 different countries, roughly, to be harmonious and balanced. Well, the, but how do they go about it? Um, and convergence of economic performance, high level of employment and social protection, raising the standard of living and quality of life. What they're doing now is the complete opposite of all that. Um, economic and social cohesion and solidarity. So the, the words are great. You know, it's uh, wonderful words. 
overarching concern was to avoid large deficits. That's the, 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 what they identified as the cause of divergence were big deficits, government deficits. That's what they thought was the main problem. So their belief was in some ways that just by hitting that one target along with having low inflation, uh, they would achieve all those grand objectives. And what they tried to do in terms of trying to um, identifying government deficits, the, 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 the proposal for, this, for the treaty was to limit the amount of de debt that governments could get into. And they believed all this would lead to price stability, you know, low unemployment, etc., etc. So looking at uh, Article 104C, governments shall have, member states shall avoid excessive government deficits. Okay. Now, the way they defined excessive was 3% of GDP. Now, if you take a look, actually, that's, that's intriguing. Let's just take a look at Fred and see if I can find, uh, let's go USA federal government deficit. Okay. And that's going from 1952. We can go quarterly from 1959 to 2014. That'll do. Let's take a look at that. So that's the absolute level. I need you to divide that by GDP to get, uh, let's see if I can actually get that done, let's see. I'll just type percentage of GDP. Type it correctly. Let's see what I get. Russian Federation, not quite what I was after. <laughs> okay, I'd need to do a bit of work to get that, but you can actually, with Fred, you can also, let's just go back inside here again. I'll see if there's any percentage ones stated here. Billions of dollars. Percentage, no, it's Russia. Okay. Uh, I'll see if I can do a transformation because it's worth seeing how how this can be done. So I've got this. That's all. Oh, that's That must be the uh, not seasonally adjusted. Let's go back and look at the... Uh, uh, the other chart was different, wasn't it? Okay, that one. Let's see if I can actually edit the graph and customize the data. Okay, let's say GDP. So gross domestic product, seasonally adjusted annual rate. That seems okay. I want it in nominal terms. And an A divided by B. Let's see. Uh, can it end with an operator? Okay, A divided by B, is that right? Oh, B hasn't been added yet. Okay, okay, so add that. Okay, I'll get rid of this first of all. So add gross domestic product. It's not responding. Hang on a sec. Okay, I'm not getting very far with that. But you can actually, if you go and play with it yourself, you find you can actually divide the deficit by GDP. What you'd find is the average GDP, average deficit, the average for the American economy, is why I was trying to bring that up, the average deficit for the whole of the 20th century has been 3%. Okay. So the Europeans were defining an excessive level as the average for America for the whole century. If you take out the wars, it falls to 2.9%. So their idea of what was excessive was itself excessive. And they also had a 60% level of the ratio of government debt to GDP is the maximum amount. When a country exceeded that, they then set proposals saying you must directly cut spending or increase taxes to reduce that deficit. Okay. So Article 105, the idea was that the primary purpose of the European Central Bank shall be to maintain price stability. Now you'll get these, what do you think the objectives are of the Federal Reserve in America? Any idea? Price stability, anything else? It's also full employment. Okay, they've got most central banks have got a mix of objectives: price stability and full employment. They just had price stability, and effectively, what they seem to believe is that if you constrain government spending and achieve low inflation, then economic stability drops out automatically. That's the belief system they had, and 
that was something which, as I said, you get disagreement from both mainstream and radical economists. So Friedman, who is the father of monetarism and a great favourite of Maggie Thatcher, here's Maggie meeting him on more than one occasion, a lot more than one occasion, um, he said that the whole idea has been motivated to by politics rather than economics, bring France and Germany together so as to make a war impossible. Now, I wonder what's going to happen when, uh, I don't think it goes back to a war, but imagine what happens if France pulls out of the euro and turns Germany's apple cut upside down next year, which could happen that early. Um, now, he believed that the euro would have the opposite effect of what was intended. And this is one of the very few times I find myself completely agreeing with Milton Friedman. He said, it'll exacerbate political tension because it'll convert diversion shocks that could have been accommodated by exchange rate changes into divisive political issues. Uh, and it, he said, political union can, you can, if you have political union, you can pave the way for monetary, but you can't go in the opposite direction. If you get monetary union first under bad conditions, that'll make political union less likely. So I was, one of the things that Mersch had to say today was that the whole objective of the European proposal is still to bring closer integration, and he was actually talking in terms of a European treasury. I think he's got zero chance of getting that through anywhere at the moment because you'd need to get 20 countries roughly that have had really, really bad different experiences out of the euro, from Germany doing very nicely to Greece having an absolute disaster, to agree to have a single national taxation system. And at the moment, that taxation would be taxing Germans more to spend it on Greeks. What are the odds of that? You know, the Germans aren't, aren't going to agree to that. So there's no way uh, that it's going to... You think, again, Friedman is quite right. So he said, if you have a currency union, then you can, you can no longer vary your exchange rate. And they're a very powerful mechanism to let different uh, countries adjust to each other. Now, it's only worth getting rid of it if you have adequate alternative mechanisms to adjust. But they were also ruled out by the controls on government spending. If you have a control like you can't know they can longer have an exchange rate, then you need to have much larger government transfers. It said no exchange rate and no government transfers either. So it really was, I've called it, I've called it a suicide pact in the past. It really is a case of, I saw a very, a very funny tweet today saying the euro is basically a case of wear a straitjacket and then attempt to do things you can't do in a straitjacket. Okay? That's fundamentally what it did to Europe. Now, then again, talking about the USA, Friedman said that you might shock that affect one part of the states rather than another. Things like, you mentioned the oil embargo, which increased the demand for oil uh, in Texas but reduced the uh, profitability of the industrial Midwest. Well, what happens is there'll be financial flows from national and state and local governments. Now, Milton Friedman was no fan of government in general, but here he's quite honestly admitting that if you have a government system like that, then it can handle those different shocks between different parts of the uh, country. And again, that's a good example. Okay. An oil increase in oil prices does Texas very nicely and does over the Midwest, comparatively. Now, you said you've got the first and, and the third mechanisms. Um, you have, you, if you, you, or you can adjust for wages and prices. Okay. And that's what's actually been imposed upon Greece in the downturn. They're forcing the Greeks to cut their wages and cut their pensions to try to make them competitive with the Germans. So you can no longer have um, offsetting flows from national and state and local governments because there is no national government for Europe. And the regional national governments are not allowed to have more than a 3% deficit and they don't produce their own money. So they're like states in the, in the United States, but the United States states have very small budgets, whereas the U United States Fed has a huge budget. The European Central Unit Central Budget is so small that I think the European Union's own debt as a percentage of Europe's GDP is about 1%. So it's a trivial budget just to function with the European bureaucracy and the uh, European Parliament and so on, whereas the national budgets are huge. So it's it, it is, you couldn't have imagined a worse way to design the whole system. So here's the example, again, that Friedman gave. Oil, buys, oil price boost globally makes Texas well off, makes Ohio worse off. You have a rise in, in taxes and a fall in welfare spending in Texas. You have a fall in taxes and a rise in welfare spending in Ohio, uh, and that evens out the, the impact of the shock. But in Europe, uh, there's no such possibility, and you've got those constraints at the national level as well. So what you had was effectively, rather than a way of, of buffering, it's a way of amplifying the shocks. Um, 
and they've added to this the idea of free flow of goods and private finance and labour between the various countries. So if you get an advantage in one country, it's compounded in its capability to take on the other countries. And uh, one thing I... Uh, We'll come back to this point in a moment. Let's just, just look at this. If you have, if, if German exports get cheaper than Greek exports, then Greece can't devalue. It can't run monetary policy to try to reduce the imports because the monetary policy is decided in Brussels, and it can't run government deficits. So it's totally tied in a straitjacket. And what it can do is borrow money from the French and German banks, and that's what fundamentally <coughs> happened through the boom period for the euro before the prices hit in two thousand and eight. So if you look at the current account surpluses of the different regions, you can see Germany bouncing along between a deficit and up to a 5% surplus before the formation of the euro. This was the impact of, of unification with Germany came in here with this plunge in their, their surplus here. So for, prior to the, to the euro itself, Germany was running a small trade deficit. Then the euro formed. Up goes its trade surplus. Equally, Spain, which was running you know, pretty much a balanced budget, started going into deficit. It absolutely plunged in deficit once the euro formed. And the same story for Greece. Okay. Then you have the crisis. They turn around, not because of any positive reason, but because they can't afford to import anymore. Whereas I think now the, the surplus for, for Germany is up to the stage of being about 9% of GDP. So it's a huge transfer from the rest of Europe to uh, to Germany at the moment. Now, before the euro came in, if that sort of trade imbalance had happened, then there would have been a devaluation of the Spanish currency against the German. But And they also they would have run a large budget deficit, which would have stimulated the economy uh, in the opposite direction to the impact of the downturn. But they can't do that now. So, um, and when you look at what the Maastricht Treaty says, the central bank has to do. It's only obliged to fund 3% of the deficit. Now, a normal um, central bank, like the Bank of England, if the government draws up a budget, and the budget includes, like, a, let's say there's a, there's a government deficit, which is equivalent to, say, 5% of GDP, which is quite feasible. America's hit 15% during the crisis. It issues bonds to finance that 5% and then spends. Now, it doesn't have to wait till the money comes back in. Okay? It just spends straight away. And the central bank's responsibility is to sell those bonds. You've got, the central bank can't buy the bonds off the government. That's a, a, a restriction that most central banks have applied to them. But it can buy the bonds off the public in what they call open market operations. If the public doesn't buy enough, the central bank ends up buying them. So the government gets its money, no matter what size the deficit is. And to this system, the European Central Bank was obliged to make sure that the deficit of up to 3% was financed. Anything more than that, no, you don't get it. And therefore, government spending the government might have planned to do couldn't be financed. Okay? So it's much more severe than the austerity you've experienced here with the, with the Tories recently. So it's got to sell bonds to the private sector. If they don't, if they don't get sold, that's it. There's no money for the government, government proposals. Now, the left attacked all that, and I've just shown you in Godley's quote. That's the paper there. Again, if you just, when you load the um, um, PowerPoint and run it in slideshow mode on your own computer. If you click on it, you'll go across to see the article. So that was published in October 1992. So you know, 25 years ago, virtually, he was warning what was going to happen with the crisis now. And he said, since there's no institution other than a bank, the sponsors must think that's all you need. Okay. He said, but that can only be true if economies were self-adjusting systems that didn't need any management. In other words, if a capitalist economy was fundamentally stable and therefore crises would be uh, unusual events rather than something systemic. And he basically, in the same camp as me, says capitalism is unstable. So it's going to have the crisis. Now, once you've joined the euro, what you've done effectively is you've, you've given away being a free nation state. You become like a local authority or a colony and you can't devalue um, but you also lose the power to have to financial deficits through money creation. If you imagine Kingston Council uh, running out of uh, getting getting a, de a deficit on its tax on its uh, local charges versus its expenditure here, uh, then it would have to issue bonds 
to finance that. And if you couldn't sell the bonds and get English pounds back, you'd have to scrap various projects. That's what's happening to a lot of councils right now under the austerity that uh, the Tories imposed. So a local government can't finance itself by creating its own money. But a government at the national level can do that because it has a national currency. Now, the European Union countries gave that away. And he said, once you've done that, then you simply can't get out of a crisis like this. So if you have a whole country or a region, you know, like the whole of the Southern Europe, uh, in Europe itself, uh, well, if you have a huge structural setback, if you have, again, a, and I'll explain where the crisis came from, it's partly what I covered last week as well, it's the same basic ending of a private debt bubble. But if you had, for example, an oil shock, let's say a dramatic increase in the cost of oil, making it more expensive for some regions, better for others, as happened in America, well, the region that suffers can devalue, and then it can trade at full employment so long as you accept that your dollars, your currency is worth less if you go overseas, and it can buy less imported goods. That's one of the impacts of a devaluation. But when you have a monetary union, you can't do that. And unless there's budgetary arrangements to make up to distribute to make up for that difference in regional impacts, like a national budget with the um, US federal government funding, um, t taxing Texas and funding Ohio when the oil prices rise. Unless that happens, then the punchline that I gave you earlier, no power to devalue, no fiscal equalisation possible, there's nothing to stop you having a process of cumulative and terminal decline ending up in immigration is the only alternative to poverty and starvation. Now, imagine how this would have been regarded as a... Because, again, that's the article there in a 1992 newspaper. I'm sure that the article... I, I, I never... I didn't... I, I met Wynne Godley about eight years after this article, and I didn't actually know the article until in the last six or seven years. Um, I would have liked to know what feedback he got about it because he would have been seen as a total extremist. He was spot on. Now, that's what pretty much happened because the, the theories that people accepted about how the economy operates that led to the formation of the euro really saw capitalism as being inherently stable. I uh, don't need any management at all. And the real source of that, and I'm going to set this as a reading for next week, by the way. Did you get a chance to read Keynes's... 1936 page, you enjoy it? Good read, isn't it? Okay, did it read like your textbooks? <laughs> so the textbooks are a total distortion. We'll talk about that in the tutorial. But I'll get you to read this guy next week because I want you to see both extremes. So I'll, I'll, I'll give this link um, in the tutorial. Ricardo, Robert Barrow had a, what he called Ricardian equivalence. And he's, he, he, they attached Ricardo's name to this concept called the Ricardian approach to budget deficits. So if you click on that link, that'll, that'll go. Let's again, it should work since we're in Kingston on its website right now. Let's see. Okay. There you go. That'll get you the article from the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Now, a bit of background. Uh, this is I've heard this. I don't know this for a fact, but I think it's quite, it, it's good enough to use in any way. Barrow apparently lived in Italy for a while, and he was he's a right-wing American. And he didn't like the fact that he would have it very hard to hire a plumber to get some of his um, plumbing fixed up in the house he owned. So he was determined to break the power of the unions in Italy. This is part of a political background of this, this sort of campaign he went on. So he talked about what he called this Ricardian approach. And he said that a budget deficit today will be offset by an identical reduction in the private spending. So the government runs a deficit with the intention of stimulating the economy Households and businesses will cut back their spending by precisely the same amount. So the budget deficit doesn't stimulate demand at all. And this is the basic logic he had. This is obviously quotes. A deficit finance cut in current taxes leads to higher future taxes that have the same present value as the initial cut. Now, I want you to read through this for next week's tutorial and think about the logic. What, what is he assuming to make that statement? That's the starting point. So first of all, he says, if you have a deficit now, you must have an equivalent in time-discounted terms, surplus in the future. Uh, and this is because government budget, the budget constraint equates total expenditures to total revenue and the net issue of interest-bearing public debt. So he's pretty much saying expenditure has to be financed by taxes. That's the proposition there. So a cut in today's taxes must be matched 
by a corresponding increase in future taxes. When you, if you means by present value, it means you've got to discount them for the how far in the future that might be. So here's his proposition. He said, suppose now, now one of my, this is a bit like saying the word assume. One of my students back in Western Sydney ages ago made a lovely witty remark that's always stuck with me. He says, when an economist says the word suppose or, or assume, what you should really substitute is the word pretend. Okay? It's a bit of a fantasy. He says, pretend now that host household demands for goods depends upon the expected value of taxes. So the amount of shopping you intend doing is governed by the amount of tax you expect to pay over your lifetime. Sound sensible? Okay. Some outrageous assumptions here. So each household subtracts uh, the money it sets aside to pay future taxes from its present income to determine how much wealth it has now before it goes shopping. Okay. So fiscal policy uh, would affect aggregate consumer demand only if it altered what people thought their taxes were going to be in the future. Said, but we're starting from the argument that the present value of taxes uh, would not change as long as no change in the present value of spending. So saying people are anticipating taxes in the future. Uh, so a budget deficit has no impact upon the aggregate demand for goods. That's empirically testable, of course, but that's the, uh, that's, that's the proposition he began from. Any increase in government spending now uh, will be offset by people spending less because they're saving money to pay taxes they know they've got to pay in the future. Sound convincing to you? We'll talk about it next week. Now, he went through various objections to his reasoning. I find this, this is really quite funny. He said five major theoretical objections that have been raised against this proposition. And I'm just going to mention the first in this lecture. The first is people do not live forever, and therefore they don't care about taxes that are levied after their death. Does that sound reasonable? Fair enough. Okay. He doesn't think it's reasonable at all. He says the argument fails that the typical person is already giving to his or her children out of altruism. Okay. In this case, people react to the government's imposed, it's all, all heavy verb, you know, verbiage in this thing, intergenerational transfers. In other words, spending more now means you've got to tax the future more, uh, which are implied by deficits of social security with the compensating increase in voluntary transfers. So what he's saying is if, if, if there's an increase in taxes now, and you expect it to be levied, say, and uh, set off by higher taxes two or three centuries in the future, then you're going to put aside money now so that your descendants in two or three centuries will have the money to pay the taxes. Okay. So households capitalise the entire array of expected future taxes and therefore effectively plan with an infinite horizon. Do you think your parents go shopping with an infinite horizon? Now this, this, this is seriously the sort of stuff that you'll find in journals. And it's one reason that I want you to read originals like I've given you Keynes and I'll give you Hicks as well and also this Varro one because what you get at the textbook level, they'll often sanitise it, make it look more reasonable. You read the journals, you see just how extreme some of this stuff is. I think it's the only way to describe that. Okay. But that's the sort of thing which turns up in the textbooks. You know? So we've got to get rid of it. Now, that really defined the euro the belief that, first of all, deficits were ineffective anyway, and therefore they should be minimised as well to stop these intergenerational transfers. That's the sort of thinking that was underlying the euro. And after the crisis, let's see what time we're up to here, checking our time, um, there's two perspectives. The, the EU itself thinks the crisis is run by governments learning too large a deficit. And, of course, that's uh, I'm still amazed to see that's the line that the Labor Party swallowed about itself in England, that the 2008 crisis was caused by, um, who was the government, who was the Prime Minister then, Brown? Brown spending too much and too much of government deficit. That's what they blamed for causing the crisis. Uh, and therefore, they thought that what you had to do was to improve confidence by what they call fiscal consolidation, which is really applying Barrow's ideas to say you should reduce government spending as much as you possibly can. Now, the alternative perspective that you'll find from people like Giannis Varoufakis and uh, the post-Keynesians that um, you've got a lot of at this university, and also people who call themselves new Keynesians like Paul Krugman, is that the crisis is caused by, uh, the, the crisis itself preceded a rise in government debt. And the crisis in Europe was 
there was a crisis in America, a crisis in Europe, um, a crisis in Australia as well, and Canada. Uh, but the crisis was made worse in Europe by rules that sent the government spending couldn't rise when there was a collapse in private spending. Um, but the alternative perspective, of course, that it's caused by government deficits is the one you'll find coming out of the leaders in Europe. And the most prominent guy is a guy called Wolfgang Schäuble. You heard of his name before? Some of you. Okay, not very many. Um, so he wrote this uh, article. Again, click on the link or go to the article itself in the New York Times. And what he's saying, German priorities and European Eurozone myths. And his argument was that he started with this statement, as in medicine, to prescribe the right treatment is essential to have the correct diagnosis. No argument there. Okay. He says, his diagnosis is the European crisis was a crisis of confidence. Not a debt crisis, not a, not a private debt bubble, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, what he said, the people treated European bonds from different European countries as equivalent. So they paid the same interest rate on Italian bonds that they paid on, on Greek bonds. But then they realised that wasn't the case. And so there was a divergence. So they started to treat the bonds, uh, like Greek bonds, much more cautiously and demand a much higher interest rate, which means they paid less for the bonds. So therefore the Greeks had to sell more of those bonds to raise their money they needed to pay, had to pay a higher interest rate on it. That's what he says caused the crisis. So the only way to stop the crisis, in his opinion, is to make people confident again in those economies. And to make them confident, he thought you had to have low government deficits. That's the logic he's going through. So more public spending wouldn't have done the trick, nor can it now. So Germany has advocated structural reforms, which means things like weakening trade unions and cutting pensions and reducing public debt without throttling growth, so he says, um, and setting a framework for cooperation between the private sector and the public, um, improving the budget deficit, etc., etc. He said in Germany this has shown tangible success. Now... Has it shown tangible success or has it shown that Germany benefits out of the euro and the rest of, the, uh, rest of Europe doesn't? Um, so he's quite happy about Germany. He said, we are speeding up debt reduction um, and the priority for Germany is modernization, regulations. Stimulus is not part of the plan. So that's really the perspective that has dominated um, Europe. And at the moment, um, both um, Poland and just sort of Poland, uh, Portugal, what's going on here? Both Portugal and um, Spain are both potentially copying penalties from the European Union for having budget deficits that are too large. So they really are penalising quite seriously. So he's trying to restore confidence by reducing government debt. And he seems to believe that if you reduce Greek interest rates, then the debt's going to be sustainable. Now, if you take a look at the interest rate spreads, there is partially an argument in his favour because you can see that the interest rate... The pink one there is Greece. There we go. So you can interest rates on Greek bonds before the euro form were enormous, 25%. Of course, the inflation rate was much higher back then as well. Okay. They fell down. By the time the euro began, there was a small difference in rates between Greece, which I've got there, and Germany, which is the red one. And then they all converged. Only a bit of a divergence there for the UK with a higher rate. Then when the crisis hit explosion in the rates on Greek bonds, continuing decline in the in the bonds on Germany, a bit of a rise in Spain and so on. But the only really outrageously big example is Greece. Now, that's really a belief that the Greeks simply couldn't pay the bonds, so they'd have to default on the bonds. That's the fear. Then the market stabilised again relatively, but you've still got this huge divergence between the two. So that's his logic as to what caused the crisis. Pardon me, <laughs> I brought the data up again. Again, that shows you the data up to, up to date. So, again, the links are all live on those on those graphs. Now, the alternative perspective is that it was caused by exactly the same thing that gave a crisis in America. I think I've got to the halfway mark. Let's take a break and I'll talk um, talk that through in the next 10 minutes. Well, should I start again? The people haven't, haven't come back, haven't they? Um, oh, I'll start and they can walk in. Here we go. Good timing. Okay. So... Schroebler's explanation was really about the specific circumstances of Europe and differences between different countries and how confident their um, bond buyers were in, in, the, in the governments of them. But the alternative perspective was it was 
exactly the same as the American crisis, which was a debt, private debt bubble that burst. And the, what the US responded with was, first of all, automatic stabilizers. So there's a, because government's revenue depends upon taxation and government spending depends upon largely unemployment, there was an increase in government spending and a decrease, uh, increase in government spending and decrease in government revenues. So they went into deficit. Then there are also specific policies like what they call cash for clunkers, where they'd give people money just to hand in old cars. Ostensibly, there's also a way to reduce the number of polluted vehicles on the, on the roads, but it gave people money for a bomb car that would otherwise have scrapped, which, of course, was injected into the economy. Then what's called for the uh, Troubled Asset... I think it's the Troubled Asset Redemption Program. I've forgotten what the acronym stands for. That was $700 billion dollars supposedly to rescue the financial sector, uh, ended up being a lot more than that. And then quantitative easing, so the large-scale purchases of bonds by the Federal Reserve from private banks trying to reduce the range of interest rates from the, from the long-term to the short-term rates. Now, the European region couldn't respond because fossil they had no treasury, <clears throat> and the austerity that was imposed by Brussels quite severely, including things like cutting wages by 20-30%, for public sector workers in, in Greece. Things like that were quite commonplace in the program. Um, it was supposed to reduce the government debt to GDP ratio, but the ratios often fell because GDP fell by more than the uh, government spending did, the government debt did. So looking at Varoufakis, have anybody read any work by Yanis Varoufakis? Okay, good, some have you heard. Okay. Uh, Yanis, another, another orthodox economist. So he said... There are four crises that he saw coming together at once. A banking crisis, which is mainly sparked by what happened in America, um, but Europe's unable to cope with the disaster. It has a central bank with no government and national governments with no support of central bank arrayed against a global network of, of mega banks they can't possibly supervise. So the capacity, you, you really need a central bank to be the agency through which you interact with banks, private banks, and the countries in Europe simply don't have one. Uh, a debt crisis, <coughs> um, which is f focusing on public debt in that particular case. Investment crisis, there were large surpluses in Germany, so um, in terms of trade surpluses. So Germany was able to invest just on the trade surplus it was running. But the rest of the country running a trade deficit. Uh, and, the, and with that trade deficit, of course, you get less profits for firms because they're being undercut by imports in their own countries. Uh, there's no capacity to, to boost the economy that way. And then a social crisis from incredibly harsh austerity. There were cases of people who were in their 70s and, and 60s and 70s deciding suicide was the best way to go, given the fact that what, the cuts to the pension were so severe they could no longer survive. So it was in, in, much more severe than we've seen happen in England, and that was severe enough. So you've got two perspectives there. But let's look at the evidence. And one little thing here, if the Maastricht Treaty was a sensible document, then the economies that did what the Maastricht Treaty provide, suppose, uh, enforced should be the ones that did best. So let's see who actually obeyed Maastricht. The rules were the government deficit had to be below 3% of GDP every year and government debt in total had to be less than 60% of GDP, accumulated debt. So which countries do you reckon actually lived up to that? Any ideas? How about Germany? Yep. Any nods for Germany? Who'd vote for Germany being one of the ones? Yep. One. Couple. Okay. France? No. Okay. Spain? No. Vigorously no. Okay. That's I really enjoy that. But Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Greece. Pick one. Who's going to... Who, who, who picks Germany? Okay. France? Italy? Spain, Greece. Okay, I wish I'd taken a bet on this. You're all like, clean up the correct answer is Spain. It's the only one that lived up to that target, and I'll show you why. Um, it's, in, in fact, German is not, I showed this in the presentation today as well. Germany's debt ratio has always been above 60%. So even the most strictly uh, austerity imposed authoritarian attitude government hasn't achieved its own target. Italy's debt's been above Greece for most of the time. The one country that had re re reducing level of public debt 
was Spain. So you look at that's the heavy one I've got down here. Spanish public debt began at about 60% of GDP, 65% when the euro began. It trended right down to 36% just after the crisis hit, then it's exploded up here to 110%. Now, through the whole time, there's Germany. Now, there's the 60% level. It began at 60%. It dipped below it a bit in 2001 and 2002. Through 2004 through to 2008, above 60% before the crisis began, then up to 80%, and it's currently running at about the 70%, 75% of GDP. So you didn't expect that, did you? Okay. You look at, you now they're hammering the hell out of, out of Greece, and Greece is up here now, post all the adjustment processes that were supposed to reduce its debt level, post when the European Union really started managing its economy, but for the entire period, its government debt level is actually less than Italy's. So there's no consistency in how these rules have been interpreted. If they've been interpreted and enforced correctly, and, and you could actually enforce the rules and achieve them, then Germany would have been forced to cut its government spending. Do you think it can actually achieve that rule? If you're running a government deficit above 60% of GDP, do you think it can slash government spending and reduce the, the ratio below that level? What's there's a catch? And you can cut government spending and just basically say you're not going to spend on you know garbage collection or universities or that sort of thing. What's the catch in trying to reduce that ratio by cutting government spending? It's a ratio, okay? You're cutting the numerator, you're cutting government spending, which is the deficit. GDP is also there. Is there a relationship between the two? If there is, cutting government spending could cut GDP as much or more and give you a higher ratio. So it's not the sort of thing you can necessarily do with a direct attack just on government spending alone. But that's what the euro was all designed to do, and that's that's the way that the <coughs> European Union has enforced it. So if you take a look at the 3% the deficit rule as well, I've just shown that with a you can just vaguely see it on the chart there with my mouse gone again. Let's try this one. Okay. That dotted line there is the 3% rule. You can see again that the only country that was consistently below that was Spain. Germany, most of the time, had a deficit bigger than 3%. Remember I said they set a target for the maximum deficit, which was equal to the average deficit that America's run for the last century. So the target itself was could be insane. Um, so it ran a surplus on several occasions, 2006 to 2009, and its debt ratio only rose after the crisis began. So that's showing the um, percent of, of GDP per year as a change in government debt. How much does it change across that period? Throughout most of the period of the, the pre-crisis period of the euro, Germany's uh, government debt was growing much faster than Spain's. Only when the crisis hit you, this explosion in Greek, in, in, in Spanish government spending, then they tried to impose austerity to reduce it, which they did, but as a percentage of GDP, it's just trip higher and higher. So now they've got an enormous deficit. Yeah? Um, how much percent, how much of percent is like the, that they pay for interest rates on those uh, budget deficits? Good question. Um, not a large amount because you're talking interest rates which are extremely low right now. They blew out for a short while. But if you go back and take a look at that chart I showed earlier, the interest rates. You know, we know government interest rates are at historically low levels. When there was the blowout, one thing Draghi did say, he'd do whatever it takes, quote unquote, to defend the euro. Uh, so the huge spreads that had built on, on all, because all these bonds are issued in euros, because the Spanish government's behind some bonds, the Italian government behind others. The rates blew out for a while, then they came right back down again. So even though you've got you know, debt, government debt running in Spain's case at about 100% of GDP, the interest rate is of the order of 1% or 2%. Okay, so it's actually a small amount so of the total budget. Like, well, like the deficit for a long time, if you have um, small interest rates, if you're in an underdeveloped country, like 10% of interest rates each year, it's not going to be benefit like you run a budget deficit. Yeah. That's feasible. The main danger there, and we'll talk, this is actually worth discussing in the shoot as well, the main danger is if you've got that debt in something other than your own national currency and you're running a trade deficit. 
those are the danger combinations. So in this particular case, um, if Spain was had its own currency, it could easily finance that deficit out of its own capacity to create money. Because with the euro, it could not do that. So that's, that's the danger that came with the euro. You, you, you could, because the, the Spanish government can't create euros. Okay, so it therefore has to tax to get the euros to pay that, those interest rates. And if it can't, then the bondholders can think we're going to, either going to default or you've got to cut your social spending. But if you're going to keep like, budget deficit, is it going to cause inflation? Well, um, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail um, in the tutorial as well, discussing this issue. But isn't that what they're trying to cause right now? Okay. They've got inflation running at zero or negative in most of the European Union. And the funny thing is that response comes back all the time. People say, won't that cause inflation? And I often say, yes, it will. Isn't that what you're trying to do? So in that sense, at the moment, they, 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 this, this, the, they've mentioned the, cent the central bank uh, board member who I was you know, listening to uh, this morning uh, was saying throughout, we're below our target, which want to cause inflation to rise from zero to 2%. And then you say, shouldn't you run a budget deficit? That'll cause inflation. So there's still this knee jerk to go back to periods when inflation was the problem. Okay, It still happens today. Uh, yes, it could, and that's partly what they want to choose right now. Now, um, Schäuble sees this as the, high, the highest growth rate uh, in those countries. Um, the debt increase there um, was of the order of 10% of GDP per annum. So he's seeing improvements that simply aren't turning up in the data. Now, when you take a look at the government that you look at the government debt versus GDP what you had in Spain this one I'm showing I've separated the two out and I'm not just showing the ratio I'm showing that the two levels you have this fairly constant level of government debt with it pardon me dramatically increasing GDP then the crisis hits and GDP flatlines or falls so in nominal terms GDP is actually falling while government debt is rising at the same time now, yeah. It's rising because you need to invest in a, in a crisis scenario. Mm -hmm. the, um, sorry, the debt is rising because the country needs to invest if you're having a crisis, actually, right? Well, I think you would normally, if you had a, cri a downturn, you'd normally have government spending rising um, because of welfare payments and less tax revenue. That's that's the predominant thing that's happening there. So how do you have austerity and even so the debt is rising? Oh, it's because the, it should have risen even more. Okay. If you look at the level of the deficit in America, and let's see if I can actually find, let's go back and see if I can find that on um, on Fred. Where's my, okay, let's just see if I can try for, Okay, United States, percent of GDP. Okay, that's what I was after. Now you can see as a percentage of GDP, the maximum deficit the American economy ran during the crisis was 13.15% of GDP. Now, what happened with the Spanish one, of course, that would have been what they'd gone to without the euro, without the Maastricht controls, but when they started going in that direction, they told me they had to cut spending as well. So they had a deficit, but it was less than the deficit they would have had if they weren't constrained. Now, let's take a look at the compare Spain to America, because, again, the whole idea of this is to try to constrain government deficits. So America really had an unconstrained approach to the crisis when it first hit. I met um, Ed Lazare, who was the George Bush's chief economic advisor from 2000 to 2008, 2009. Uh, I met him in 2010 at a conference, and he was describing the mood inside the Bush cabinet when the crisis hit. And he said it we went, we went from being blasé about it when they had when they thought it was going to be just a typical sort of downturn to sheer panic. And he said there are a whole bunch of people who are total fans of capitalism, who thought that it was quite possible capitalism was going to fail on their watch. And they weren't about to let it happen. So they were really, really panicking. And they threw everything they could at it, including things like the, the uh, cash clunkers scheme. 
So huge deficit, large amounts of spending. And the end result of that, you would think, if you think in a very direct sense, that government spending leads to higher government debt. In fact, the rise in the government debt in America, which is the blue line, was less than the increase in government debt as a ratio of GDP in the Spanish case. So being relaxed about the deficit in one sense and just spending as much as you need to turn the economy around actually meant that though they started with a, a higher ratio over time, the Spanish who were trying to constrain their spending courtesy of the rules of the euro actually ended up with a higher ratio. Okay. So again, this whole idea, a direct attack on something which is a ratio is rather a challenge. It doesn't necessarily work. So what you see in terms of government deficits, that's comparing the ch change in government debt to GDP, um, there was, when austerity was imposed, the Spanish had got to much the same level of, of debt as a percentage of GDP as the Americans had, and then they were forced to cut it. Okay? Now, the Americans continued sustaining it across this period, and finally, when the recovery began, then the ratio could fall, which it did. And they're now down around the region of the Maastricht Treaty targets itself, while the Spanish, it hasn't worked. So the, the GDP is falling faster than they're cutting the debt. Consequently, they've got this huge, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio is high. They're trying to cut the numerator. The denominator is falling as well. That's the real trap they got caught in by following the Maastricht rules. So there's a stabilisation in the debt ratio for America because its nominal GDP is growing. Spain's has been stagnant for most of that period. You can see, again, what I've done is I've graphed them so the I've got the uh, Spanish one on the left-hand axis and the American on the right-hand axis. And you can see that the growth in the Spanish was actually greater than the Americans. They had a big boom, which was largely driven by the housing sector. Americans, a smaller boom. When the downturn occurred, a sharper downturn in the – and sustained downturn in the Spanish, the Americans did have a downturn in nominal terms, but by about 2010, they were back on a rising nominal GDP – whereas the Spanish nominal GDP has fallen for most of that time. It's only turned around in the last um, couple of years, last year and a half, and that's actually largely because private debt is rising again, as I'll show you in a moment. So what about the crisis itself? Well, remember I took you through Minsky's financial instability hypothesis last week and saying that what you get in the capitalist economy is a system which is driven by credit. Minsky's starting point was to say that the natural place for analysing the relation between debt and income is to take an economy with a cyclical past that is now doing well. Well, he's hypothesising a link between debt and income. Okay. And that sets him outside the mainstream well and truly. So one corollary of that, and I'll develop the argument in more detail uh, in the next couple of weeks, is that demand and income come from two sources. There's the turnover of existing money, so people can buy with money they've currently got, and when you buy something, you, your expenditure becomes income to somebody else. Okay? Or you can have new money created by new debt. So if you go shopping with a credit card, when you swipe your credit card, you increase your debt. Okay? And you increase the income of the shop you purchased the thing from. So the increase in debt is an increase in money and it's also an increase in spending. And, of course, in the modern world, with governments actually trying to constrain their uh, spending by trying to limit their deficits, which is a global fetish. Private banks are the ones that are mainly creating the money. So total demand and total income depend upon a fairly stable turnover of existing money. That is declining, but it doesn't fall savagely and rise dramatically at various times. So that's actually stable. The really volatile one is credit, changes in private credit. And if you look at the United States... Uh, there was a private debt bubble, which financed the sub subprime bubble. There's, there's actually three bubbles in America in rapid sequence. There was the telecommunications, which was building optical fibre throughout the country and we were building the backbone for the internet. Then there was what's called the dot-com bubble. You heard of dot-coms? You know, okay. Uh, which is another bubble that burst around 2000. And then the subprime, which was, began at about 1997. So they basically overlapped with each other. In this case, case, the banks were financing, first of all, roll out of telecommunication fibre. Then they were financing the dot-coms. And then finally, they financed the subprime bubble. So those three bubbles kept private debt rising throughout the whole of the... Yeah. Back to Monday, was the 
The Deathstone one, Crisis. Which one? The Black Monday they, they call. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was there was there was actually there was a the the the, the Nasdaq busted in two thousand. Actually, one one funny thing I've been um, the. I've got really good luck on that front. You don't want to be with me in New York if you have money in the stock market because I happened to be there on the day of the NASDAQ crash. And I gave my first ever presentation as an economist on the day of the 87 stock market crash. And there's a third one. I think I was actually also there for a 2007 bust. So, you know, that was the 2000, you're right, 2000, about a 14% fall in the NASDAQ in one day. And that in fact, the Nasdaq finally fell by about 70%, I think, and then recovered. The Dow was down 14% in the one day, second largest fall in history. So if you take a look at the private debt level, you find that they both had enormous debt bubbles in private debt. This is looking at the ratio of private debt to GDP. So going right back to 1945 for America, and this is the fascinating thing, the ratio of private debt to America has been rising ever since the Second World War. It's only fallen on a few occasions. That is 75, a decline there, a big decline after 1990, then this huge peak, and then the fall since then. It's now started going a bit positive. Look at the Spanish. Okay. It dwarfs the bubble that occurred in America. Began later, 1995. I'm not, I don't have data before 95. I might see if I can actually locate earlier data for Spain. But clearly, huge bubbles in private debt, which both burst at roughly the same time. You can see the, the peak in the Spanish was about 2000 and, or maybe 2011. The peak in America is 2009. Okay. This is a global phenomenon, in other words. It's not just something which is um, based only in Europe. And then if you take a look at the, the change in private debt, which is, I define credit as the change in debt. So if you think about debt as what you owe, then credit is the change in the amount you owe on an annual basis. And that change in debt is what's financial spending. So if you have, say, in your own personal case, if you have £10,000 you owe, you also, you're, more, you're more than 10000 right now, don't you? Okay. Um, and you go to 18000 a year later, you've created £9,000 worth of money, as well as having £9,000 of debt. And that £9,000 has bought various things, like, for example, my salary. It's mainly bought the vice chancellor's salary, but it's, you know. So you, you're creating income and expenditure by that money. Well, you've got this period of rising credit in America from the depths of the, of the 1990 recession where credit grew by only 2% of GDP, which is quite low, up to 10% around 2000. And you can see the downturn occurring there, which is when the NASDAQ popped, up to 15%. And then the plunge from that down to minus five. So when you have, when you borrow money and you spend it, you're actually cre you're creating money and creating demand. If you pay your debt down, you're destroying demand, as well as reducing money and supply. Does that sound sensible? That sound crazy, by the way. Can you repeat? Yeah. Uh, if you borrow money, you're creating. If you borrow money from a bank, you create money and you create demand at the same time. If you pay off your debt, you're destroying money and also destroying demand. That sounds sensible or not? I didn't agree with it when I first had it said to me. I thought people were wrong. It took me a while to work out the logic. I'll shake you through that if you like in a, um, one of the later lectures. Why do you mean is that like the, the credit system, like a lot of that thing, like they rely on people not paying their debts? No, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I'm talking about live because that's probably the best way to do it. I'll just actually bring up, um, let's see, that's uh, that's this presentation. Let's go across to my ECB talk because I've embedded the graph I wanted to show you here. This is um, my Minsky software that I stuffed up completely showing you how to use in the tutorial last week. Um, I'll do a better job today if we get around to doing it, but I'll show you. This is, this is a model of the banking sector as if the banking sector simply enabled savers to lend to borrowers. So the idea you get taught in textbooks says that people put money, save money, and the bank lends that money out to other people as investors. That's the basic story you get. So this is actually a model by Paul Krugman, and I have put it into my dynamic software terms. I wish I could make that larger. I can't actually make the, um, the tables larger in the software at the moment. But what I've got here is a consumer goods sector, 
which is lending money to the investment goods sector. And I'll show you through the, and I've got it seen in, in four ways from the point of view of the banking sector, the investment sector, the consumer sector, and the workers as each sector. What's actually modelled here, which is the neoclassical idea that banks arrange loans between savers and borrowers. So in this model, the consumer sector are the savers, so they are lending money to the investment sector. And then the investment sector will also repay the money. And, of course, the reason the investment sec the consumer sector is lending to the investment sector is they expect to get an interest payment. So there's an interest payment going from the investment sector to the consumer sector. And then this vision of banking says banks are just intermediaries that arrange loans between savers and borrowers. They don't actually originate loans. So what I've got them doing here is they're paying a fee to the bank. Now, then I've got the remaining thing is about workers consuming, workers being hired, investment and so on. And if I simulate this model, what I get is a growth rate, which is the top graph here, that heads towards zero. This is GDP here running along very slowly. I'll just shut down those windows because there's a little bug in the program right now and it, it goes faster if I shut down these, these tables in the background. So you can see it racing along now. Now, what these two controls here are, are ways that I can vary the rate of lending and vary the rate of repayment while the program is running. So that's currently saying it takes roughly seven years to roughly double the level of debt. So if I make it five years, that's an increase in the rate of lending. And notice that the growth rate actually dipped when I did that. It's gone back to zero again over here. GDP is still flatlining. There's an increase in the debt ratio. If I slow down repayment, so that rather than repayment roughly halving debt every nine years, let's say it halves every 30, then the debt ratio screams up again, as you can see. No change in the growth, trivial little blip in the growth rate there. And the debt label is stabilising at pretty much the debt level we've got now, about 200% of GDP. So huge changes to debt. Let's now say we have the banks drastically, the lenders drastically slow down how fast they're lending and people really rapidly repay their debt. And we'll go back to where I started from initially. All those changes, huge change in the debt ratio, almost nothing on the growth rate. GDP is still running at the same level. Okay? So that's the vision that the mainstream has, which is why they ignore banking. Now, what I uh, have argued for decades is that, as part of the, the um, post-Keynesian school, is that banks actually originate. Okay? They're not intermediaries, they're originators. Okay. Think about them that way. So I can do that with Minsky. I can show them, well, let's just delete this idea that the debt's an asset of the consumer sector and delete all the rows that indicate that there's lending between the consumer sector and the investment sector. Like, I've got to make a couple of other changes to make this consistent, but this will give you an idea. And then I'm going to go to the banking sector and say, well, in fact, the debt is an asset of the banking sector. So I can click on this little down arrow here. I've just I've removed the debt as an asset of the consumer sector, but it's still sitting in the program as, an, as a liability. Yeah. Yeah, so does that mean, so does the fund have a minimum year, you know, like, for example, when you borrow a mortgage, right? Yeah. So the fund has a minimum year to repay the debt, and then you can keep on borrowing until you repay the debt. Yeah, the banks will, well, this, this is more looking at how, in the aggregate, how debts are repaid over time. But if you imagine taking out a mortgage, at the moment, you normally take a mortgage of 25 years. Yeah. Okay. So what if you can actually pay quicker? Like, what is the minimum? Do they have a minimum? Well, they've, like they've put various controls to try to force you to not pay in a rapid time. Yeah. They want you to have the debt for as long as they can, but you can pay off more rapidly if you want to. You'll face penalties if you pay more rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, and I've actually copped that myself on a couple of occasions. I'd be very wary about borrowing money from banks. And I paid it off. Paid off my bank my first debt too quickly, and they hit me with a four thousand dollar fine for paying off the debt too quickly. I was really impressed by that. So if you're going to take a fee, you still got to pay. Yeah, I know. They, no, get, right. they get you both ways. This is more talking about the speed with which we're doing it in the aggregate. So if you imagine a booming economy, like, like I showed you with that graph a while earlier, then loans are increasing really rapidly, repayments are really slow. When a crisis hit, people try to repay the debt more rapidly and lend, banks lend more slowly. So I'm showing that change here. What I've got to the halfway point, I'm going to choose debt as being an asset of the banking sector, and the program remembers that it's still a liability of the investment sector, and I'm sort of going to show that the interest is paid to the banking sector, and the idea of a fee I think is silly, that's about intermediation, so I'm going to delete that. There's more changes that I should make, 
But having done that, I'll just shut these windows down so they don't slow the program down. Okay. Now remember what happened beforehand. Let's run it again. And you've now got a positive rate of growth. You've got growth in GDP. Notice that? <laughs> the lending is creating more money. And if there's an increase in the rate of lending, the growth rate rises. If repayment is slower, there's more of a boom again. And then if people decide to repay more rapidly, the growth rate plunges and you can have a crisis. Now, all I've done to build that in there is to say banks originate lending. So it's actually quite a natural thing once you think in the financial and monetary terms about an economy to understand what's going on I'm going to, in um, a situation like here. So at this stage, when you've got enormous amounts of lending being done by banking sectors in both countries, of course, a lot of the Spanish borrowing, they're borrowing from French and German banks. Okay, So French and German banks were lending to finance construction activity in Spain. Anybody here been to Spain or from Spain? Okay, we've, we've, enormous housing estates were built, a bit like Ireland in the same sense, huge housing bubble, far bigger than America's. Then you hit a peak level where people simply stopped borrowing and you went from positive credit down to the stage where there's no credit, a little dip to negative, slight rise then, and now they've plunged down to the stage where the reduction in spending was as much as 15% of GDP per annum. So much money you would normally have spent buying goods and services Instead of spending or using to pay your debt down, you actually reduce expenditure and income at the same time. So that's why they're in a huge slump. America had not as big a boom, not as big a slump, and as, two, as of 2012, Americans are borrowing money again. So there's net credit creation, which means net demand creation. That's the fundamental difference between the two economies. So the crisis began when the rate of growth of debt slowed down. At that point, for Spain at that point for America, and then it was sustained and severe in the, in the, in the Spanish case, it stopped much more rapidly in the American case. So the depth of the impact of private sector credit destruction was worse in Spain, and it's been kept that way because with the government opposing austerity, people are going bankrupt still, which reduces debt and credit, and people are trying to pay their debt down if they can because yeah, they've got no income really coming in. So that was the actual crisis. Now, when you look at when, when doing a lot of empirical work on this to make the case uh, a bit stronger, but if I correlate uh, unemployment to the change in debt, I've turned unemployment upside down. So zero unemployment has shown up here and 12% down here. The correlation between change in debt, which is credit, okay, and unemployment is ridiculous minus 0.93. Now, that's actually treated as being, regarded as being zero by mainstream economists. They just ignore it. They don't look at it. They say, well, there should be no significant effect. They're actually ignoring something as big as that, which is why they're getting it so completely wrong. If you look in Spain, it's even more ridiculous. It's a shorter time period. The correlation there is minus 0.97. Now, the people who are managing these economies are saying, well, the correlation is zero. I mean, they might as well be running for president of the United States, mightn't they? Pardon me. That'll do my chances of getting employed by Donald Trump. No good. Okay. Um, so looking at change in government debt, you find in that case the correlation is positive. Okay. So there's a positive correlation between unemployment and government debt. What do you think is the causal direction? Unemployment rises, what happens to government welfare spending? Increases, what happens to government tax revenue? Okay, so I think the causal link is going from private sector, yeah. There is also a big correlation between unemployment and inflation, right? Yeah, that is uh, that is definitely there. It's, it's more complicated than people realise, but that's, that's a large part of the argument behind what's called the Phillips curve, as you've got from your macro course, yeah. Um, but the... Causal, I'll show you a more complicated model where I put these all in together in the flowchart structure, but the basic idea is that workers' capacity to demand wage rises depends upon the unemployment rate and the rate of change of unemployment. So a low level of unemployment gives workers significant bargaining power. And of course, so if you have a booming economy and there is a shortage of labour, 
then one thing businesses will do is offer higher wages to try to get workers for themselves. So it is a it's a power relationship, um, and it, it's not a it's not a tra- it's not a trade off. You would see it described as a trade off in your textbooks. It's not a trade off. Okay? It's a much more dynamic process than that. But when you have high work wages, workers' capacity to demand wage rises, and they can demand wage rises in excess of productivity, then the inflation rate will rise to, to compensate to some extent. So here's a correlation in America, a 0.8 correlation between unemployment and the change in government debt. And in Spain, 0.9. So the unemployment rate is fundamentally what's driving the size of the, the deficit. And because you've got 25% unemployment, you're going to have a high government deficit, even if you're trying to keep it low. You need to completely slash unemployment benefits to reduce it when you had 25% of the workforce out of a job. Now, they're doing that, but, of course, that is fueling the rise of right-wing and left-wing parties in those countries. So it's getting more and more dangerous, and I think we're going to see a lot of that danger erupting next year. So the key point that I take about looking at the economy in general is the change in private debt, which is credit, is really the main driver of economic activity. It's certainly the most volatile one. We have two sources, as I've said, the turnover of existing money and creation of new money by the banks when people lend. And the, the former is much less volatile than the latter. So most of your dynamics comes out of what's happening with the private sector. So you start with seeing the rising private debt reducing unemployment. There's, that's where your negative correlation comes from. And the correlation goes from the change in debt to the level of employment because that's what lets you hire workers, a high level of credit demand. Or credit will mean you're hiring lots of, buying lots of things, including hiring workers. Um, a crisis when, when you have a, a debt crisis begins, you have a falling rate of change in private credit that's going to reduce demand and income and cause rising unemployment, which is what you've seen in those data charts. And then the level of unemployment drives government spending. So you have a if falling unemployment's occurring, which the Spaniards had for that boom period when the housing boom was on, lots of people were being hired to build, build, build houses and many other things. That gave you a huge lot of government revenue because you had low unemployment and high wages and high profits as well. Plenty of government revenue coming in. So falling unemployment meant the government deficit fell and actually went into a surplus. Then you had rising unemployment. The government deficit rose because they've got welfare payments on the one side, less revenue coming back in on the other. So you get a positive correlation in that particular case and the causation goes from the unemployment to the change in government debt. And what the Maastricht Treaty does is prevent that rise in government deficit during a crisis. So rather than being like an air conditioning unit that if it's getting cold outside, it warms the room, the Maastricht Treaty is like an air conditioning system where it gets cold outside, it chills the room. And you have the leveraging continuing because government spending doesn't rise enough to stop it. So if you in the, in the American case, because the American government went from... A, it's about a 3 or 4% deficit to a 15% deficit. That gave people cash flows they wouldn't have had otherwise. And with that cash flow, they could pay their own debt down. Okay. But in the Spanish case, they're trying to pay their debt down and the government's taking money out of their accounts as well, or trying to by running a surplus. Italy has the same sort of pattern. This is the level and rate of change of private debt in Italy. And you can see the crisis hitting, and there's a plunge in credit from 15% of GDP down to zero, and now it's running at about minus two, minus three percent. So it's also deleveraging, and the level of debt is flatlining. Notice that there's this huge drop in the level of credit. The level of, of debt doesn't change all that much. There's still plenty of compounding going on there. And the correlation between private debt and unemployment in Italy, not as high as I've shown you for the other countries, but still high enough to impress, minus 0.73. So the data is extremely strong in rejecting the case that people like Schäuble make. That's just behind the Maastricht Treaty. His government debt change in unemployment, positive correlation, 0.62. So Schäuble was right. You've got to give the right diagnosis to cure a disease, but he's given an incorrect diagnosis. The actual cause of the whole crisis was private debt, which they ignored. So that ballooned, and particularly in the Spanish case, I'll show you a chart that I, I used to compare Spain and Greece in uh, 
in today's talk with the um, central bank. Let's see. Uh, hang on. Okay. That's the difference in private debt between the two countries. So Germany didn't have a private debt bubble. Spain had a gigantic one, which then burst. And the Nastri Treaty completely ignores that private debt. So if you take a look at the... They obsessed about the government debt. Now, that was falling, rising for Germany. Now, they both breached the Maastricht rules. That's what the treaty ignored. Now, in terms of the comparison, you can see the numbers. The peak level of government debt in Spain is 115% of GDP. Even after the crisis and the huge reduction in leverage over that time, the private debt level is still 170% of GDP. So private debt is generally bigger in most countries in the world than the government debt about which they're obsessing. So we really have to rethink what we think about the dangers of different forms of debt. I'll talk about that, and we might talk about that in the tutorial as well as we're discussing Keynes. So that's an important little question I want you to get your head around. So you have rising debt before the crisis, which causes a boom, but it gives you a rising ratio of private debt to GDP. Then the boom becomes a slump when that rate of growth becomes negative or goes slows down. If you have a, a government that's not constrained by something like the Maastricht Treaty, its spending rises, and that slows down how fast the private sector delevers. And you get a recovery, but you've still got a very high level of private debt. But if you have constrained government spending, the private sector keeps on deleveraging. That's what it's still doing today. And you have a continuing slump. So by enforcing austerity, which is supposed to return the economy to you know, growth according to the um, Schäubers of the world, it creates a depression. Now, Germany, on the other hand, uh, has had falling private debt. You look at the level and rate of change of private debt, it's fallen from about 130% of GDP down to 110%. And credit's actually been very, very low. Why do you reckon Germany might have a low demand for credit? Where does Germany get its money from? Pardon? Sorry? Somebody said something. <laughs> Those are the two ways to do it domestically. But the third way is exports. So if you export goods from Germany to America, the Americans pay you in dollars, the dollars come back to the central bank, you give the dollars to the central bank, they would pay you back in mark, as they used to do. Okay. So one way you can create your money domestically is to have a trade surplus. Now Germany is running about a 9% trade surplus. So the surplus that big, it doesn't need to borrow money from the banks. And it can run a government surplus, in fact, because there's so much money coming in from the export surplus, which is also based upon, of course, the euro. So with Amer when you try to look at the relationship, in fact, that's actually stronger than I realised. I can break, you've got to break the data into two bits there before and after the crisis. But you get a much lower correlation for the German, the German economy because it has this huge trade surplus and has actually had falling, falling levels of private credit. But fundamentally, Germany is not the sort of country you'd want to use as an example of what the rest of the world can do. Because to do what the rest of the world is, for us, the rest of the world to do what Germany is doing, what does the rest of the world need to do? It needs to run a trade surplus, doesn't it? Can the rest of the world run a trade surplus? That's the problem. It's a zero-sum game. Okay. Bank money creation and government money creation are not zero-sum games, but Trade is. If you're one, one country's running a surplus, necessarily the rest of the world's running a deficit of precisely the same scale. The, the, the positive thing I can say for the German economy about this is that it has a very good system of, of tenants' right, tenants rights. So if you're a tenant in Germany, I'll have this confirmed by enough people to know that it's true, 
I haven't actually seen a contract that says it. But if you're a tenant in Germany, you're required to supply the kitchen. Yeah, I like the facial reaction there. Not not the knives and forks and the plates, the kitchen. What do you mean, like the stove? Um, everything. You've got to provide the, 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 the fridge, the the sink, the cupboards, the oven. Oh, why do you mean get it for yourself? Yeah. When the other tenant moves out, they'll take the stuff with them. Okay? You've got to provide a kitchen when you move in. Now, that, if you consider the rights that gives you to modify where you live when you're a tenant compared to the rights you've got in England, okay? You want to put up a picture in the English, you know, you want to knock a nail on the wall to put a picture up, you're terrified the landlord's going to get angry. In, in Germany, they expect you to have the place for 10 or 15 years and decorate it the way you like. So tenant rights are that much better. So consequently, people don't feel pressured. They've got to get out of being a tenant. Okay. I think it's actually a very positive thing. They've got good rules like that. So consequently, rather than mortgage debt rising through the roof, as it did in the rest of the world, it's fallen from 70% of GDP down to 54%. And that reflects two things. First of all, they don't need to borrow the money because so much is coming in from exports. But secondly, they don't need to borrow the money as individuals to buy housing because it's quite okay to be a tenant for your life in Germany. You get much better rights and it's cheaper than it is here. So this is one of, uh, by the way, this is a cartoon. This is a good friend of mine. He wrote this, did this cartoon. Uh, I suggested the text and he did the cartoon. He's a Marvel Comics quality cartoonist. And making the point about trade balances, there's... Um, Merkel lecturing Cyprus to say, we run a surplus, why can't you Greeks run a surplus? And Cyprus says back, well, that's because you're running a surplus. Okay. It's a seesaw. If it's traded, definitely is. And the Greek debt, which looks like it's all being money that you know the, the Greeks are being paid and that they're wasting the money, etc., etc., it's all being used to pay back the banks that they borrowed it from, which are mainly French and German banks. So if you had a breakdown in the euro the French and German banks would be in a very bad way. And I think they will be that way next year. So the future, we've definitely got a depression going on there and there's no willingness for the Troika to change its policies. That was true last year. We're now got to say that it's quite probable that, with, yeah. Sorry, you know that uh, Germany's lending money to Greece right now. Are they, um, Germany's lending money to Greece. Yeah. Uh, are they charging interest right now? Oh, yeah. But they're changing the rate of interest that's on the bonds, so it's a low rate of interest. But what's actually happening with all that money that's supposedly going from the <laughs> European Central Bank to finance the Greeks, it's financing their debt to the banks because to get the money, they can't, again, because they, they can't create their own money, to get the money for their projects and they have to borrow the money from the banks. So, in fact, they've got huge debts to the private banks. The lending, they also... Hmm. Effectively, they're being given the money to repay the debt they owe to the banks. So what you're really doing with this, you know, the so-called rescues that they're doing is rescuing the banks that they're paying the money to. So I think we're going to see a huge change now, though, because with all this stuff happening, you've now got two political parties that are quite likely to come to power in France and Italy and break out of the euro. I love this comment from Giannis. He's uh, saying that, his, his whole focus now is what he calls bringing democracy in Europe by 2025, the thing called the DM25 movement. And one reason I'm less prepared than I'd like to be for most of my tutors with you guys, I'm writing a document for them that was due to be finished on Tuesday about banking reform. So uh, I'm involved in the projects they're putting forward. But Giannis, in talking about what it was like to be finance minister and talking with the other finance ministers of the European Union, he said he'd finished giving a detailed economic case and when he finished, he might as well have sung the Swedish national anthem. They paid no attention to what he said and went on with the rest of their business, though he hadn't spoken. So they're completely for failing to engage with the scale of the crisis they've got. So I'm expected the depression to continue, uh, all in living standards continuing as well, and then extreme political change, which, of course, was much more extreme than the time of the Great Depression. But we've got the, you know, these two parties, the Front National in France and the Five Star Movement, and the other nationalist movements are all rising. So... I think it's leading to the fragmentation of Europe and the rise of right-wing parties again, which is something they were trying to stop in the very first place by forming the Europe. So, that's it.
Take a break. See you in the seminar.